So with much further ado, let me talk about something that I'm very excited about. To me, it's kind of a privilege to share this with you today. This particular organization, my involvement with them has been a personal odyssey in many ways. All the years of doing management consulting in the TOC field, I've always had this niggling doubt in my mind that does this stuff really work? Are these guys knowing me, or are they really doing what I'm telling them? So I had the opportunity to get involved with this company, First Solar, <coughs> about a year after I moved to the United States, which is in the year 2000. So before I go any further, let me do the standard stuff I have to do. We're a publicly traded company, so I have to make this statement that says anything I say in here is kind of with reservation, right? I'm making no forward-looking statements about the organization, nothing that I say you can hold against me for any financial impact it might have on your stock portfolio. So this is the standard disclaimer. Good, now with that out of the way, I can start talking about the interesting stuff. What am I gonna cover? What is this company? Where did it come from? I'm gonna to talk to you about the introduction of theory of constraints within this organization. I'm gonna talk specifically about the application of all those well-known tools of ours, drum buffer, rope critical chain, the mafia offers, thinking processes. And then I'm gonna end off talking a little bit about my observations about where do you go when you've done it all? What do you do next in an organization that every single one of these applications have been embedded in the organization, they're running fairly well, what next? Where's the next boundary for TOC? Good, so let's start off with first sort of, where did the company come from? What's the strategic objective of the business? Um, our job is to reduce the cost of solar electricity to a level competitive with conventional energy, enabling solar to become sustainable mainstream source of energy. So that's the company's focus. Um, our job is to reduce the cost of solar modules using thin film technology and automated scalable production. Now inside that little statement is a whole history, probably five volumes of writing about what we did there. And for us, the objective in this organization is to migrate from a subsidized market to a non-subsidized market by leveraging the economies of scale to become subsidy independent and to reduce our dependence on scarce natural resources and curtail the greenhouse gas emissions to improve our environment. This is what First Solar is all about. So let's talk a little bit about the thumbnail history of the company. In 1999, this company existed as a little company called Solar Cells Incorporated, based in Toledo, Ohio. The company had been working with a very um, risky technology in producing something called thin film solar cells. Thin film solar cells are different. There are two classes of technology, which I'll talk about a little bit later thin film technology and, and uh, silicon-based technology. By this stage in 1999, the company had burned through about $37 million of um, entrepreneurial investment capital. They haven't had anything that vaguely resembles a manufacturing operation. They had some equipment, they had some research guys that were working on this thing, but they were really at the end of the road. At this point, they met up with a company called True North Partners, which is the private investment arm of one of the Walton family children. Now, between the four Walton children, who's Sam Walton, who's their father, started Walmart, between them, they're the richest people in the world, between the four of them. John has a private investment company, and he, through a gentleman by the name of Michael Ahan, got to do with First Solar um, at that stage when they were on their last legs. And they decided to put some money into this thing because they were intrigued by the solar, the thin form solar cell manufacturing capability. So in 1999, John Walton bought the company, essentially. First made an investment, eventually bought up all of the stock. Mike got involved in there. The company was a shambles. They had 50 employees. They made 50 to 60 solar panels a week. Half of them didn't work. The maximum efficiency of the solar cells was around about 6.5%. Now, just for your information, one of the key measures in the solar industry is how much energy that comes from the sun do you actually manage to convert into usable electricity. And that measure is what they call efficiency. And the standard condition, the standard sunlight insulation, how much power do you get? So, um, the journey from there has been a pretty tumultuous one. And I want to share it with you as we go through here. So, in November uh, 2006, the company went public, raised $450 million on NASDAQ. We um, were crowned by the end of 2007 as the most successful IPO for that year most successful company all of 2007. We're now the largest thin film module manufacturer in the world. So you can imagine going in the end of 19, 1999, beginning of the year 2000, from a company that had 50 people, 
to a company that is now the largest solar thin film manufacturer in the world. That's a space of seven years, from literally nothing to the largest. We're now the lowest cost photovoltaic manufacturer in the world. We have the very first totally pre-funded collection and recycling program in the industry. In other words, for every single solar cell that we sell at present, we already have the money set away to recycle that product 25 years from now. So what do we do now? At this point, just to give you an idea of where we are from where we came from, we started off on this top left-hand picture. You can see where the number 2005 is on that little top picture. That 2005 sits on the building that was the second factory built in 2002. The little piece of building that's above the number 2005 was the original plant that John Walton bought. The plant at the 2005 number is double the size of the original plant. The plant where it says 2006 is the next plant we built, which is four times the size of the 2005 plant. The picture in the middle is the plant that we just built in Germany. That plant is double the size of the one that's built in 2006. The picture at the bottom is our facility that we're busy building in, in Malaysia at the moment. Each one of those buildings, there are four buildings on that campus, every single one of those buildings is four times the size of the plant we built in Frankfurt. Five years. So at present, um, this gigawatt of cap capacity as a matter of interest represents about 1.3 million solar panels a month. Now you can imagine going from producing 50 solar panels a week to producing 1.3 million solar panels a month is kind of a pretty rapid growth rate. So what do we have? Some interesting facts of company. I'm just going to skip through these pretty quickly. I'll just pull them all up. So what are the key issues around about these plants? The first plant, that little one above the 2005, is the first plant that enabled us to scale up a manufacturing process that did not exist anywhere in the world. These plants, and I'll share some of the details with you, are completely automated. We stick a piece of glass in one end of the plant, and we take the fully completed solar module off the other end of the line. And only one operation that we couldn't get rid of is there one touch by human hand in this operation. The rest of it is all automated. It's not a single piece of work that's done by anybody other than automated equipment. So you can see some of the facts. We qualified this in 2006, and I'm going to talk about that again. We have now three lines in the plant in Toledo. We have four lines in Frankfurt. We have 16 lines going up in Malaysia, each one a replication of the other. So we went from 50 people to about 1,460. We should be around about 3,000 people by the time the Malaysian plants are completed. We have expanded our organization from a single office in Toledo to offices in Germany, in Europe, and in Malaysia. So it's been a pretty fast growth rate for us. Those of you that have followed the stock market will know that our stock opened at $20 a share, went up to $315 a share, which in a way was a validation for us about the value that Wall Street placed on what it was that we were doing and how we were running the company. At the end of the session, I'll read you what Fortune magazine said last night about us. So what's this technology all about? Let me quickly differentiate between the two fields of technology. There is crystalline-based solar modules and there is thin form-based solar modules. Crystalline-based essentially has a five-step value process. It starts off with the creation of crystalline silicon on the left-hand side. The, um, this is dependent on crystalline silicon foundries. Foundries cost about $1.2 billion to produce a 10,000-ton foundry. It's a very, very capital-intensive piece of equipment. Five or six major players in the world that dominate the creation of silicon feedstock. The second one is out of the first silicon feedstock, we produce ingots, which is also used in the semiconductor industry to produce computer chips. Those ingots are cut into wafers, which are uh, nanometers thick. On the back of the wafer, we create something called a solar cell, where we dope it, we create some contacts, we cut this up into cells, put some back contacts on it, and then we stitch all of this together in something that we all know as a solar module. You've all seen these guys with little black dots on them. So what's interesting about this process flow? Well, firstly, it's highly capital intensive on the left-hand side. It's highly labor intensive on the other end. So the, the, the ability to get into this industry at the back end is very easy. You just need a bunch of hands in a room, and you can get into module manufacturing. So this process, in and of itself, dictates that there is an enormous amount of, of cooperation between these different segments of the value chain. 
When the company started First Solar, we said, well, how do we get rid of all of this complexity? Is this to focus on a manufacturing process that enables us to take all of it out of the process? And the thin film solar modules literally go through a single plant in a box concept. Stick a piece of glass in the one end, we do all of the layer construction, the cell manufacturing, the back contacts, the doping, the sealing up, constructing the cell, putting all of its mounting brackets on in one single integrated operation. I'll give indication of what these things do. Uh, the, the cycle time from end to end is about two and a half hours, and we throw off a, silo, a panel every 20 seconds. Go straight into a box, we stick them on the back of a truck, and we go install them. So what do we do with these things? Well, <coughs> these modules produce about anywhere between 72 and 75 watts of power per module. They have an anticipated life of about 25 years. The interesting thing about the thin film technologies is that they tend to start up much earlier in the morning. When the sun just comes up, they start generating energy. They last much longer in the evening before they actually shut down. So in the full day's energy production, the thin film modules are much more stable, much more reliable, much more capable. This is the graph I really wanted to show you. The yellow bars represent our throughput in modules from when we started this TOC journey, 2001, to where we are today. And this gap's pretty outmoded. <laughs> so we were doing 50 modules a week, 50 people, half of them didn't work, 6.5% efficiency. Now, in quarter two, 2007, we were producing 500,000 modules per month. We, our efficiency is around about 10.3, it's at the moment um, getting close to 11, 10.87% efficiency. And if you look at the growth of this thing exponentially, it has been an absolute rough ride for us to be able to grow a company this fast. There's some interesting aspects that I, if we have more time, some other time to talk about. Going from 50 people to 3,000 people in the space of five years, is an enormous job to integrate everybody into the culture of the organization. So where did we start? Doing some very simple things, which you'll all recognize. By the way, this shows our field performance, highly stable product. Um, we're a company that we describe as egoless. Everybody that joins the company says the first thing that strikes them is there are no egos. If the CEO goes out to buy a sandwich, he'll walk to the office and says, can I bring you a sandwich? He comes back with a box of sandwiches for everybody. It's the kind of culture First Solar has. Always underplay, always overperform. You can see our modules produce 105% of uh, rated energy production. That's because we, we rather err on the low side than sell something that's not going to do what it's supposed to do. We have a fully integrated recycling process. Every single module we make comes back to our organization, even now in the stages where they still produce the production waste. But when they come out of the field one day, we will pick them up, recycle them, pull all the key metals out of them, cadmium, tellurium, and recycle them back into the product. And I'll talk about that again because it's part of our mafia offer. <coughs> What's our target strategy? We work in something called ground-mounted systems, very, very large solar arrays. Um, commercial rooftops, which is the other major field that's opening for, up for us, where people are now starting to utilize very large industrial buildings to run solar installations on top of them pretty common sense way to do this. But here's what I wanted to show you as far as scale is concerned. If you look very carefully on the far right hand side, this is a solar farm that's being built in Germany at this point in time. If you look very, very carefully, you'll see that little black dot at the bottom right hand corner is an automobile. And on the far left in the middle, you'll see there's a little green square. That's a football field. So that gives you an indication of how large these solar farms are. This thing will, will support, um, I think, in the order of about 40,000 households in energy needs. This is huge. The, um, when we started off in our focus of first solar, we had an option of going to three different markets. A residential market, a residential rooftop, where you put 10 or 20 panels on your home. We had the commercial industrial field, and we had what's known as free fields. Free fields is where people get investors together, they buy a piece of land, they find an interconnection permission with a utility company. They build a solar farm. This thing runs for 25 years. It's, it's kind of like an annuity, right? Because all this thing does is sit out there and make energy. And you get paid for it. 
So First Solar sort of focused on this market sector very strongly for a very important reason, is that we wanted to scale the capability of the technology as fast as we could. And since we didn't want to spend as much time developing the back end of the business, getting into all those residential rooftops, our focus was on going after these very large free field installations so that we could run extremely high volumes through the business. Why did we want to run extremely high volumes of the business? Because we knew that this game is all about throughput. So one of the things that we do in our organization is to drive the concept of throughput. And I'll talk about that again, because it's probably one of the most underrated pieces of technology in the whole of the TOC body of knowledge. So where did we start? 2002, we got going. 50 associates producing 30 to 50 panels. We um, had the CEO at that stage recommend the TOC, the TOC Center to the uh, chief executive. Uh, we had dodgy technology. We really didn't know what we were doing there. Very shaky manufacturing process. We had an unknown market. Nobody knows we were going to sell this stuff. There was enormous infighting. Even within the R&D group, the scientists were saying, well, we need to be separated from the other scientists because we're better than what they are. So we had these massive silos inside the organization, even though it wasn't all that big. We got involved, Bob Fox and myself initially. Um, the company was literally living from hand to mouth. If you talk to some of the old guys there, they'd say, well, they didn't have any cash. They used to go to the school furniture auctions and they'd buy little school desks as office furniture because they couldn't afford anything better. The first thing they did is to say, stop turning knobs. People were running these manufacturing lines and they were kind of, by democratic consensus, decided what the heck they were going to change. So the very first thing we did is bring some discipline into the organization. We brought DOC in, we brought Six Sigma in, we brought the Gucci methodology in here to run structured experimentation for us to be able to get a handle on the business. So what about the DOC side? Simple things first, right? Everybody reads the goal. Step one. Step two, everybody goes through some 10 exercise. I was quite amused in my office uh, last week. I was overhearing a conversation between our government affairs department, all the legal guys, and somebody in Europe talking about a contract. And the lawyer on, the, on our side of the phone says to the guy in Europe, I don't want to be the blue machine. That's how far we've driven this thing into the organization. Every single person first saw it understands throughput and operating expense separation. People know. Everybody's seen some 10. Everybody knows. You've got to focus on the constraints of the system. You've got to make sure you buffer it. You've got to make sure everything else is balanced so the things flow. Step three, we started with critical chain, PM sim for everybody, so everybody understood when I work in any system in the organization, it's either a manufacturing issue or it's a project issue. It doesn't matter what you do. You're doing one of, the, one of those two things. And if you're doing manufacturing, go find the blue machine. If you're doing something that's a project environment, go find your critical chain. So we moved from this turning knobs facility to a constraint-based facility. We got extremely strong leadership from Michael Ayan, who's the CEO of this organization. And I must say, the TOC in this case is only a means to an end. Mike Ayan is a guy that when I put him down in front of Sim 10, who's the CEO of this organization, he's now one of the richest guys in the country, got Sim 10 in five minutes. He just got it. And I was listening to my marine friends yesterday, and I could see the similarity that if you have people in the ex see executive positions that really get TOC, it drives it, right? They know that this is what's going to make the organization work. So Mike had a very large role to play in us being so successful. So in 2003, one of the first constraints was, well, what about our technology? The line we had didn't work all that well. We said, well, we've got to break this constraint. We have to build a new line. Now bear in mind that none of this technology exists anywhere in the world. We were building machines from the ground up. We were, we were developing technology on the fly as we went. So we started developing what we call Generation 2, which is in that previous picture that I showed you where the 2005 number was on that building. We had TOC meetings every week until it became real. And I use those words with great circumspection because one of the things that we, you have to do to get TOC to be an enduring part of an organization, it has to be real. It has to be part of the vernacular, part of the culture, part of the tool set, part of the way that people think on a daily basis. So 2003, we started off with our very first critical chain implementation, running Concerto software as the backup. Um, these engineers have never built a factory of the size and magnitude that was twice what they've ever attempted before. Lots of resistance, lots of, lots of fear, lots of concerns. 
We sat down with them, built a critical chain, said the plan's going to be done in February 2005. We said, we take the, if we take the times down, we think we can build it in October 2004. We did. We finished it in October 2004 against everybody's secret reservation that we were never, ever going to meet that timeline. That had a profound effect on the organization. The mere fact that these guys could build a plant faster than anybody thought they could created a mindset and a, and a belief in themselves that was incredibly strong. Today, we can build an entire plant in six months from groundbreaking until it runs. We bring a lineup from the day that we turn the equipment on to the day it produces product of exactly the quality standards we want in seven days. Any of you guys that have built plants would know that's pretty awesome because to get all the bugs out of a manufacturing plant that you built from the ground up takes a pretty long time. We have this policy of copy smart that says we will replicate every single plant as, a, as absolute replication from one facility to the next. So we can take people out of one plant, put them in another plant, and know exactly how the equipment works. Everything's the same. It all functions the way that it's supposed to. But I want to emphasize this point, that building this confidence, what, and this is what Critical Chain did. It brought this confidence to people that they could take on an extraordinarily challenging project and bring it in ahead of everybody's expectations. And that mindset is lasting in the organization to this day. This little graph is one of my favorites. This is what I call the, the double camel graph. It goes with me wherever I go. It has no base in fact, it has no base in reality, but it's an enormously powerful little graph. It's based totally on intuition. And it goes something like this. It says that whenever we, a company hears about a new initiative, something that's new, here's a new way that we're going to run this company. You get this spike in enthusiasm, right? That first line that goes up. And everybody says, wow, this is good stuff. We've got to do this. We think we should bring this into the organization. Then at the top of that curve, people realize, well, you know, I'm actually have to, going to put some time into this thing, right? I'm going to have to set aside some of my job, and I'll get involved in this pesky improvement initiative. And what happens? The enthusiasm comes down very rapidly. People start finding other reasons to do other things. And then, as we progress with the implementation, we find some initial successes. And then this enthusiasm graph starts going up again. And then at the top of that second hump of the camel, people realize that this is a point of no return. This is actually going to happen for a long, long time in the organization. And then people say, well, this is going to make a fundamental change to the organization. And then they really get scared. And then the enthusiasm comes rocketing down, frequently below the horizontal axis. We start getting resistance to change. And if you then keep on pushing and the results start to materialize and it gets to be embedded in the organization, people say that this is really, really working for us and it's really part of our organization, then the enthusiasm curve goes up the other way and then it keeps on going. And this graph I take with me wherever I go in the organization. When people come and cry on my shoulder, then I take out the little double hump hump camel graph and I said, where are you? No, I mean, this is taking up too much of my time. Well, I told you it's going to happen, remember? You're on this first downward slide of the double hump camel graph. And I said, oh, now I understand. OK, well, let's go back to this thing. So if you want to take anything away from this presentation, this is it. The double hump camel graph. Looks like a charm. What about DBR? So we put everything that we have into your scene into this business. These manufacturing lines are built as fully integrated lines. This is the only official photograph that we ever published about this thing. These lines are highly integrated. They're fully computer controlled. They take a piece of glass, as I said from the beginning, they spit out a solar panel at the end. Now, anybody that knows highly integrated lines know that they are a bitch to run because they have lots of inter inherent variability. The equipment um, frequently has inherent variation profiles that you cannot predict. Bear in mind that nobody's ever built these things, right? We were the only company in the world that built this technology from the ground up for ourselves. So what did we have? <clears throat> well, firstly, the company was very much under the radar from 2000 to 2006. I have an article in my office written in Germany. It's called Last Man Standing. And it goes about First Solar being the only company in the world working in cadmium telluride technology, which nobody has ever made possible as a manufacturing capability. All the other guys have gone bankrupt. BP Solar had closed down their cadmium telluride plant. Nobody else was interested in this technology. And the essence of the article was these guys are on the way out. Meanwhile, we were frantically working to build these plants. We developed this copy smart manufacturing strategy that said everything we do must be fully replicable in any other plant we build. We had proprietary equipment designs that created constraints for other people. 
One of the questions we asked ourselves, and another thought I want to leave with you, even though the TOC focuses on relieving the constraints within your own organization, one of the most important questions you should ask yourself is what do we do that creates constraints for our competitors? So when we found the guys that could build the technology for us, we entered into an agreement with them that said, we will buy the machines, but you can't sell the technology to anybody else. And they said, oh, well, you know, you guys are a startup. Don't worry about it. We'll sign this little contract. Don't worry about it. Now that we're a public company, highly successful, we have people like GE in the game. We have some other very large players that all of a sudden are very, very interested in this technology. And they rush off to the suppliers and say, we want to buy these pieces of equipment. Can do it. Create constraints for your competitors. So huge challenges to stabilize the manufacturing process to ensure high throughput. We spent many nights trying to get this equipment to work well. Um, let me go, there's another slide. This one's the one I'm looking for. Constraints and buffers. How does DBR work in this plant? We, one, of these, one of the other things we did to a level of obsession is to build some computerized simulation models of everything we do. It's also one of the most underrated capabilities in the TOC environment. Is because we deal with large system behavior, one of the ways to get people to buy into this is build a good simulation model. So whenever we do anything to any of our lines, we first build a simulation model. And then we sit down with everybody that has anything to do with the system change and show them what the simulation tells is going to happen. You get two major advantages. The first one, you get people the op the op give them the opportunity to express their reservations about what you're doing. The second one is to show them how their reservations have either been accommodated in the simulation or not. It helps you to make it even more robust. The second one is they can actually see what the system is going to do before we do anything to change it. How does it work? You'll see between these two yellow arrows, just on the turn on that line, that's where Herbie is. The blue machine is right there. These lines, instead of being designed as, as, as capacity balanced lines, were from the outset designed as capacity unbalanced lines. So everything preceding the top arrow and everything beyond downstream from the, the second arrow, everything has increasing levels of capacity going away from the constraint and coming down into the constraint. So that gave us two things from the start. We could accommodate any unknown variation in non-constraint resources without affecting the bottlenecks. It also gave us the opportunity, which is another part of our continuous improvement process, is not only do we have people focusing on the bottleneck machines now, we have people focusing on every single non-bottleneck machine we have. And their mandate is very simple. Create as much protective capacity as you possibly can. It's not a bottleneck. It's not affecting throughput. But your job is to build protective capacity now while we also work on the constraint machines. Where the two arrows are on the top is a robot cell that acts as our buffer. It is interlinked with all the machines. It will stack and destack solar panels based on what the inherent variation in the lines are. Where the second arrow is, we have a space buffer in the line, which will stack and destack whenever we have variation in the downstream side of these lines. What does this do for us? It gives us an uptime in excess of 96%. Consistently, 24-7, 365 days a year. So there it is. It's always exciting when I take people on plant tours around these factories to show them the bottlenecks, show them the blue machine, show them the buffers, show them the, the robots that are actually managing these buffers dynamically every single day. Project management, I spoke about our, our initial we work with critical chain in building our first major plant. Today, every single plant is run on critical chain, new plant construction. We have dedicated critical chain project management guys. Um, we completed our initial plant way ahead of schedule that gave everybody the support they needed to know that they can actually go and replicate this thing on a very large scale somewhere else. Those buffer charts go all the way to the board of director meetings. The boards of directors look at the buffer charts themselves. How are the plants progressing? How are we doing? There are multiple issues on the, in, in issues on the go. Now, we run critical chain in our MIS department. Anybody that's worked with software development guys, are they the prima donnas, right? You don't touch those guys. We've got them into a CCPM. We've got them into pipelining. We also moved um, f into a new business called EPC, where we're now moving forward into building our own solar farms, EPC work. All of those are also on critical chain. So it's the, it's the default methodology for anything that resembles a project. So the power of success. So this critical chain piece, as I mentioned, brought enormous confidence to the team. They took on much greater projects. You can see this bottom photograph is an updated one of our facility in, in Malaysia, which is an enormous campus. 
We have buffer reports that go all the way to the, to the board of directors. Um, one of the other interesting things to us is when we built the um, 2005 plant, and we looked at our critical chain, all our machine builders were on there. 70% of our critical chain was not in our hands. So we said, what are we going to do about this? Well, all we can do is go to these guys and tell them to put in critical chain. So we did that. We went to our, our machine builders and said, listen, guys, we want you to shorten the critical chain, and the only way you can do this is run critical chain. <laughs> so I was, very, I was very honored at the last realization conference this year to have our machine vendors present their case study at the realization conference where they've enabled the shortening of all of their machine construction times. What was amusing in that presentation is that they're now putting pressure on their suppliers to put in TOC. So there's another lesson, right? Have the confidence and the conviction of what you know about TOC, that you can use that to influence others to do this stuff, and it goes all the way up the supply chain, and everybody benefits. Okay, what else? The mafia off. Now, this is kind of an interesting one. So we were building these plants, right? And we said, well, who the hell are we going to sell all these modules to? We don't know. Okay, so we've got to figure out a mafia off. So these free field installations where we build these very large scale industrial size solar farms, the market opened up in Germany where the German government put in a subsidy together that would promote or stimulate the creation of the building of very large scale solar farms. There was a caveat though that this subsidy or the, what they call a feed-in tariff was going to scale down over time. It was going to get less and less and less and less and less. And we said to ourselves, what, what mafia offer can we make the market that will secure us, our business, for a very long time into the future? And the one thing was that nobody else, no other solar manufacturer was prepared to guarantee supply at prices that would match the reduction in the feeding tariffs. So we said, that's where we're going to make the mafia offer, which we did. We went to the major installers and we said, you guys will supply your solar modules. And we will guarantee you that we will reduce the price in line with the reduction of the subsidies that you're going to get to build these things. But you sign a long-term contract for this. The upshot is that we have our plant sold out six years ahead of time. We don't build a plant. We don't build a plant unless we have the complete capacity sold before we build it. So that's one of the issues about thinking about where the mafia offer might be and how do we leverage that to be able to create capacity for us. Okay, so then the, that's when the constraint moved to the market. We have some other mafia offers in play at the moment that um, I unfortunately can't share with you. What about the thinking process? Everybody goes through the thinking process, from the CEO downwards, all the executive vice presidents, all of the vice presidents, all of the senior management guys, they go through the Jana program. At the end of that attendance, of the Jonah program, they get a little certificate that says, within the first solar community, you are now known as a Jonah. And then people stick this up in their little cubicles all over the place. Now, if I go back to what I mentioned earlier to you about us assembling a, a crew of people from 50 to close to 3,000 now, an interesting thing happens, because we draw these people from all walks of life. Now, we have one very strong criteria, is that we only employ what we call A players. We go through an extraordinarily complicated employment selection process, and we pick really the very best we can. That has two downsides. The one is we get people that are highly opinionated, and we get people that have extreme strong strength of their own convictions, right? So it, it, it gets worse. You put all these guys together, they come from all walks of life, they have very strong opinions, very strongly motivated people. They want to do their thing. How do we bind them together? We bind them together through this TOC concept of operating expense versus throughput. One of the things that we hammer home into every single guy that walks into the company is this is a throughput-driven business. And in the one-day TOC fundamentals class we do, we, do a, we make a very explicit, explicit separation between cost world companies and throughput world companies. It's the central tenet of why we think the way we do. Everybody knows that that's the way the organization functions. Hence my example about the lawyers talking about not wanting to be the blue machine. It reinforces the throughput culture. If you had to sit in a three-month uh, business meeting, business management meeting, the very first thing the CEO puts up is his current reality tree. So this is where I think the constraints are going to be. That gets vetted by everybody. Everybody has a chance because everybody knows the language. That's a great advantage of the thinking process. Over and above that, it enables you to find the constraints. It creates a common language for the organization. We, 
And this question of building a cohesive culture in a company so fast, with so many people, this has been a major contributing factor for us. Everybody speaks the same language. Everybody can do the conflict diagrams. Everybody can do cause and effect. Everybody understands categories of legitimate reservations. It is the vernacular of the company. Here's an interesting one, TOCIS. And I just got my signal for five minutes in the back, so I have to speed this up a bit. When we had all these manufacturing lines running, we said, well, how do we motivate the guys to get these things to go even faster? We created a system called TOCIS. When Ellie was talking about software earlier on, it kind of was amusing to me. We had created a system that's called the TOC information system. And it projects on the screen on the side of the factory, four times the size of this screen, a single representation of the entire manufacturing facility. And the, whenever the constraint goes down, all hell breaks loose. This thing goes blood red and it starts flashing red lights. It says this thing is down. Automatically triggers the maintenance guys that they must get into action now to get that constraint up and running again. If any of the non-constraints go down, it does the same thing, but it gives you some indication of how much leeway you have based on the size of the buffers to fix this thing and get it back online again. On that display is also a real-time count of throughput from every single manufacturing line. So you can see that graph go up minute by minute by minute by minute of how the plants are doing. It had an enormous motivating effect on the plants. Now people are trading these day-to-day -day throughput accumulation graphs between plants. It's all centralized from our head office in Phoenix. We can see every single constraint in every single line, in every single plant, every single minute of the day, and we know exactly what the constraint status is. We know the buffer status. We know what every single line is doing. It's kind of a neat development. It doesn't exist anywhere else. So what made it work for us? TOC is a means and not an end. It's a very important lesson. The most fundamental driver for this thing is a management team that really believes really believes it's possible to drive organizations to really high levels of performance. And it does not come through doing the TOC thing. It comes from an inherent understanding of our own capability and belief in ourselves. Provided the central concept around which we could build a very strong throughput driven corporate culture. It is extremely strong. This throughput thing is throughout our organization the one critical thing. When we had our last uh, conference call with Wall Street, uh, our CEO talks about a throughput-based company. We just invested in another business, Solar City, in, on the West Coast. One of the rationales for us buying that business is that they're also a throughput world thinking company. It's a criteria for us. We um, have extremely strong buy-in and support from the CEO and the board of directors. Um, we focus very heavily on this differentiation between cost world and throughput world. We um, use the tools in all possible areas that we can, can find. Uh, we've built an enormously strong confidence in our own capability. We've, we appoint people at senior level because they're good in TOC. Our president, Bruzon, which is a guy that used to be with Intel for many years, we roped him in as our, as, as our new president. And in his announcement of his appointment, one of the things we said in there, he's a TOC journal guy. Um, so we have one of the lessons that I have taken away from looking back at the six or eight, seven years of doing this is that these small applications all the way through helped us to build this ever-increasing ever confidence that we can actually do major things. And we have this critical mass now and bench thing that perpetuates our throughput culture. Now, one of the things that has put me in a position to do is hire the best. Because as my, as my work expands, I'm, I'm building out a team. I have some people that work with me. I use Skip Reby quite often as a consultant to help me do this. I picked some of the best guys in the industry to come work with me, and I'm still looking for more. So then the question was, if, if you ever found yourself in a similar situation, we had to take a company from literally nothing, a small 50 people operation, to the best in the world, and it's class. What must you be able to do? Some of the things that I think is important. You have to be able to assimilate many individuals from many organizations in a very, very short period of time. TOC played a very large role in doing that. You have to step up to the challenge of truly rapid change. Really accept that things are not going to be stable ever. Strongly support a culture of how can I help. People that come into organizations say they're blown away by the fact if they get into a meeting, people say, how can we make this happen? How can I help you? It's not a silo-based organization. It's not we can't do this, we can't do this, we're protecting our turf. 
able to work very closely with others, frequently unknown people. You don't know where they come from, you don't know what they do, but you have to find a way to work with them. We don't hesitate to configure or reconfigure systems and processes as we need to. But on the other side, we spend an enormous amount of time standardizing the stuff we replicate. Our plants, every single plant is a cookie cutter technology-wise of the others. And it's okay to talk about conflicts. That's an interesting one, right? It's not, okay guys, we're not gonna talk about this. It's explicit. You come with your five box diagram. And you say, this is what I'm trying to deal with, guys. Help me figure this thing out. And the use of the common language and being a throughput-driven organization has played an enormous part to get us to be better. So what is the summary? Create an en some enduring mindset of throughput world, world versus cost world. That's really important. Have a very strong champion. Um, the CEO commitment for creating a new culture was a very important factor for us. Uh, we work to spread this thing across all levels of the organization. It's just not, a, not just a management thing in one area. It's not just a management thing in some part of the organization. We're working to spread this into the supply chain. And we have a very capable group of internal individuals to support everything we do with our TOC tools. I got an email this morning, early 7 o'clock, from one of our guys about an article that was published in Fortune yesterday. It talks about First Solar as a company that's fanatical about achieving its, its goals and objectives. That's the way the market perceives this organization. And it comes about because of this exceptionally strong throughput-based culture. And I think that's about it. I could talk for 10 days about this, but I won't bore you with more. <laughs> <laughs>